the first thing that you want to have your technicians do when customers are upset is you want to make sure that they acknowledge the situation that they're upset or that they acknowledge their desire to cancel. If you sidestep that or try to steer a customer away from that direction right off the bat, uh, you're not going to get anywhere because now you're battling against what they want, even if it's not exactly the outcome you are looking for, right? So first thing, acknowledgement, right? You want to validate that customer's feelings. And then later on, we're going to try to find a solution that includes them keeping our service. Welcome to the Bug Bucks podcast, a podcast designed to help you become a bug money millionaire. Today's episode is brought to you by Bug Bucks Plus, the number one course designed to help you start and grow your pest control company. I'm your host, Eric Bassett. Alan is traveling today. He's actually over in Honolulu at Pest World. So I'll be flying solo and covering part two of our retention episode. Before we dive into that, I just want to remind everybody listening, the best way to receive new episodes is by subscribing to our show on your preferred podcast platform like Apple, Google, Audible, or Spotify. If you love the show, please leave us a rating and a review. And one last reminder, if you haven't joined our Facebook group, go to Bug Bucks, that is B-U-G-B-U-X. We've got over 3,500 other pest control owners in that group waiting to connect with you and share their thoughts. That's also the best way for you to share your feedback on our show and have your questions highlighted and discussed here on the podcast. So make sure you find us on Facebook and join the group. So just a recap from the retention part one episode. A few weeks ago, we got a sneak peek at an upcoming Bug Bucks Plus course that's going to be dropping within the next few months. It's a comprehensive and detailed course on the ins and outs of retention, which will walk you through everything you need to know about saving customers. I was able to walk through my outline for the course and cover the first five pro tips when it comes to saving customers. Today, I'll be diving into tips six through 10. So far, we've already touched on how the following categories affect the customer experience and ultimately impacts your customer's decision to stay or go. In the last retention episode, we covered initial impressions, like how your customer experiences your website, Google listing, reviews, and the ease of access of getting in touch with you. We also covered the sales process, like how well your sales team communicates with your customers, if they gather their wants, interests, and needs, and also is able to set appropriate expectations for the service. We talked about the initial service and the initial impressions that your technician is going to give your customer, how well your technicians communicate, and the service protocols that they're following when it comes to doing the service. And of course, the expectations that they're gonna be setting with your customers when it comes to what they can expect from post-service. Speaking of post-service, we talked about some care, some touch points, like sending a new customer letter after the initial service is done. We also talked about ongoing newsletters and emails, ways that your customers can experience you in an ongoing format, aside from just the regular services, and also creating engaging content so that those customers see you in a nice, engaging, positive way. We talked about customer service, which had to do about availability and response time when it comes to customer service calls and contacts from your customers into your office. We also talked about the overall experience, the vibe that your customers are going to feel when they're on the phone talking with your customer service reps, how well those customer service reps communicate and how well they set expectations, and also how well they're able to execute internally on the solutions that they make for those customers. So if you have any questions about any of that stuff that I just talked about, go check out the retention episode part one that dropped just a few weeks ago, and you'll be able to get a detailed lineup of all that stuff. Now we're going to dive into tips six through 10 and cover the rest of the customer experience and show you how we continues to play a role in customer attrition. So we've kind of stopped at that little customer service section and the next part or the next step in the customer experience is usually the ongoing treatment. It's the regular ongoing services, whether that's monthly, every other month or quarterly. So in my situation, it's quarterly treatments up here in the Pacific Northwest. So when it comes to these ongoing treatments, one of the first things we need to focus on is communication. And that's usually coming from the customer service team. Sometimes this is automated. You know, you have automated uh, emails and texts and phone calls letting your customers know when you're going to be there. If you don't have something like that set up, 
That's kind of step one. Customers want to know what to expect. That's a, a big thing that we're going to touch on in a lot of different places in this episode. So that initial communication is going to be really important, and especially if your customer calls back in and has questions about what the employment's going to include. You know, hey, you're going to service the inside, you're going to service the outside, or hey, when you guys come out on this regular service, I'd love to have you treat the inside of the house, whatever the situation is. We want to make sure that they're easily able to call in and that all of the notifications that we're going to be sending them are clear and give them a very clear idea of when we're going to be there, how long we're going to be there, all those other things. So creating expectations is going to be huge, especially if they call back in and they have specific requests. Our customer service team needs to be able to set appropriate expectations. Um, all those same things we kind of talked about before in the customer service section in the last episode, just making sure that they know what to expect. It's a huge thing. The next thing is going to be kind of the ongoing impression and the way that your customer experiences your technician. So we talked about the initial impressions, that first technician that gets there. And I know that some companies have start techs or start technicians. Uh, they're the technicians that do the initial services only, and they might not always do regular treatments, which could have its advantages. You know, if, if you've got a technician who's very, very thorough, very personable, and he's the one that's doing that initial service, you're going to get a really good experience for the customer with that technician. However, if your other technicians that are doing regular services don't have the ability to provide the same kind of engagement, well, I think we're kind of missing out on something here. So you want to make sure that the impression that your technicians are giving your customers is consistent from the initial service through all of the regular services. The other thing we want to make sure of is that the service protocols are also the same. Now, of course, we want to make sure that these service protocols are good, right? they're effective. We talked about that in the last episode. But we want to make sure that they are consistent across the board. And when we communicate with customers about what products we're doing, why we're doing it, when we're doing it, and what's important about you know things like, hey, this is the product I'm going to put here, you know, don't mop it up, or this is the product I'm using this day instead of this product. When we explain those things to customers, they remember from service to service. And if what we're explaining or what we're doing is not consistent, then they're going to pick up on that and it's going to feel really complicated in their mind. And the value that they see in the service gets impacted by that. So consistent service protocols, consistent communication about the protocols, those are going to be important. The next thing is a little bit tricky for technicians because I know it's not on the top of their mind, but we're going to talk about wins here. And again, wins are the wants, the interests, and the needs of the customers. We talked about this with the customer service scenario and our you know, inside sales team gathering wins to make sure that we're delivering on the value of what the customer sees. The technicians usually are in a very operating format, right? They want to come in, provide the service, you know, make sure the customer's happy and get out of there. But the making sure the customer's happy part is specifically tied to the things that they're interested in. So if a technician goes out to the house and he's looking through the service notes and it says things like um, classic car in the garage, you know, be very careful or, you know, make sure that you treat the Arborvita in the back patio or whatever the situation is, you have these special notes in there so the technicians know exactly what the customer wants, what they don't want, what they want you to be aware of, what they see value in, what they think is important. So when you're communicating, you can say, hey, you know, based on the service notes here, I understand that this is what's important to you. I'm going to make sure I take care of that for you. Is there anything else I can help with? So on and so forth. So technicians, when they focus on wins, that ensures that the customer's experience is filled with value that when the technician leaves that customer thinks yeah that's worth it right the next thing we're going to talk about is execution and this has to do with the technicians actually executing and how well they execute on the solution that we told the customer about in the first place now i know there's going to be a little bit of grief here because when a customer service person or an inside salesperson provides a solution to a customer Sometimes that solution isn't always viable when the technician actually gets out to the house. And I get it. I'm sure you guys probably all have some kind of experience where the, the salesman or the inside 
uh, customer service rep tells the customer something that is just not realistic. But what I'm talking about here is as long as the solution is viable and it's realistic and it is what's supposed to be happening, I want to make sure that the technician actually executes on what's going on. So again, if the notes, appointment notes say, you know, ants in the kitchen, spiders in the basement, and, you know, wasps in the place set in the backyard, and the technician goes out there and he does, you know, the ants in the kitchen and maybe checks for the spiders in the basement, and then he zips out of there. He's like, great, I'm done, right? Well, if that customer's kids go out and play on the swing set and get stung, you're not just getting a phone call back with a customer who's disappointed that you didn't do what they expected. You're going to get a very angry phone call from a customer who's got a kid who just got stung by a wasp and hopefully they're not allergic. So that's what I mean by executions um, or execution by the technician. So make sure you kind of keep that in mind. Next thing is going to be expectations from the technician's perspective. So, you know, when you finish up with the service and you're talking to the customer about what you did, how you did it, and why that's important, you also want to mention the expectations. Like, hey, just to let you know, uh, the products that I put down, they should take effect within about 7 to 10 days. And that's when you could see possibly an increase in activity. That's normal. It's typical. But if you do notice activity outside of that 7 to 10 day window, feel free to give us a call. We're happy to come back and take care of that for you, right? The issue here is not all technicians say that. And what that ends up leading to is the customer experiencing your service in a way that they think is ineffective. So in two days, they're going to go look and see activity, whether it's ants, earwig, spiders, whatever. And they're going to think, ah, man, is this really working? I mean, the guy was just here and I'm still seeing activity. You know, maybe this company just isn't good, right? Or maybe the technician's not very effective in what he's doing or the products aren't really up to snuff, right? So setting those proper expectations are going to set you guys up for success and missing those expectations. Wow, that's going to set up a cancellation call. So keep that in mind. The next thing we're going to dive into here is reviews and referrals. All right. So um, after the technician's done with the whole service, we've done expectations, all those things. The next thing that we're going to want to do here is asking for feedback, right? How did we do? And this is the most easy thing to do at the very tail end of a service for a technician. You're there possibly with the customer and, you know, maybe you knocked on the door after everything was said and done and you say, hey, you know, Miss Johnson, just wanted to follow up with you. I, I just squared away your service. The house is all treated, fully protected. I made sure I, you know, took care of that wasp nest on the back patio back there. Is there anything else that I can take care of for you today before I zip out of here? And she says, no, no, you were, you were great. And I say, perfect. That, that's so wonderful to hear. You know, do you feel like I was able to deliver a five-star service today? And she says, yeah, yeah, you were, you were great. You guys are always awesome. And I say, that's so wonderful to hear. Thank you so much for the feedback. You know, you might get a text message uh, here in the next you know, hour or two that's asking for feedback on how I performed today. And I strive for tens, and I also strive for a five-star rating on Google. And if there's any other additional feedback you can give me, we would love to hear it. So keep an eye out for that. And she says, sure, not a problem, right? And I get in my truck and I'm out of there, right? So that whole scenario, that referral, that review, that feedback kind of scenario, that's so important. It's the best, most appropriate time to get feedback and get reviews. And those reviews will start to build referrals. Because if I have a whole customer base that is very happy with my service and they've gone on Google and they've uh, given me a review. They're openly, publicly stating this company is great, right? They're giving their stamp of approval on it. That's the social proof that I need to get other customers on board. And then the next time I come back and I say, hey, you know, I, I love that we're able to take care of your service today. And I love that you're able to, to let me know that, you know, we've delivered a five-star service. You know, who else do you know that would love to have a service like this? Who else do you know that would find a lot of value in having a service like this? Now, maybe they don't say anything right away. Maybe they don't have anybody on the top of their head, and that's okay. And they go, you know, I'm not really sure. And I say, not a problem. Here's a business card, right? Here's got a little business card. It's got a QR code on it. They can scan it anytime. It'll take them to our landing page on our website. It's got a cool little discount on it. When they call in, 
make sure that they mention you by name and I'll make sure that you get $50 off your next month, right? And they're like, oh, wow, thank you so much. And I'm like, you're welcome. Good to go, right? So that whole scenario, it, it's kind of this nice little funnel, right? Good services brings good feedback. Good feedback solidifies customers' commitments and value. Their value gives you opportunities for reviews, gives you opportunities for referrals. The whole thing just kind of acts as this big funnel. So um, another thing real quick just to mention, um, and this is actually kind of a perfect place to do this, we have a premier vendor, okay? Uh, it's a sponsor that's going to be sponsoring this podcast episode plus providing fantastic deals, discounts, and services for our Bug Bucks Plus members, and that is Applause. Applause is one of the best review platforms that I've ever used. We currently use it at Natura Pest Control. And if you are looking for a way to drive reviews and drive customer and technician engagement and find a way that your techs can receive additional compensation through tips and you want to be able to track your net promoter score and you want to have a really engaging leaderboard where you can track stats and you want to have really good metrics that you can talk about with your management team when it comes to reviews. If you're looking for all that stuff, Applause is the platform for you. So make sure you reach out. You can find them online. I think it's applausehq.com. I'll have to double check on that. We'll put a link in the show notes. And uh, if you're on our Facebook group, we made a post about it recently about applause. So make sure you go ahead and check that out. All right. Next thing we're going to dive into here is what I call customer loyalty letters. Okay. And this is a proactive approach to ensure that you and your customer are on the same page and you can kind of reach out to your customers in a, in a general format. And if you guys remember from the last retention episode, I talked about doing these new customer letters, right? When a customer signs up, you send them out a letter that, that talks about your service and your mission and vision and values of your company and a few different things. This is super, super similar. In fact, for us, it's almost the exact same format. But instead of saying, you know, thank you for joining Natura Pest Control, it says, you know, thank you for being a loyal customer, right? So again, just the format of that letter, top paragraph is all gratitude. Thank you so much for supporting our business. As a local family owned and operated company, it means the world to us, right? Big gratitude there. And then we talk about our mission, vision, and values. You know, our dream is to provide an effective and simple pest control solution to our community and to provide jobs and opportunities to those in our community, right? Then we also throw in some photos of my business partner's family and my family. Want to make sure we get kind of a personal connection there. Show them that we're not afraid to put our face on the company and uh, kind of commit to them. We also give them some warnings. And this is this is a really popular thing um, in the Facebook group that you guys have asked about is, you know, what do I do about all these door-to-door -door sales guys in my area, right? And realistically creating a good relationship and providing a good service and all those things are great. Sometimes it's nice to be able to give customers a very clear and explicit warning. And we do that in our, in our letter, in our loyalty letter. We say, Hey, just so you know, you might have representatives from other companies that knock on your door and they might try to tell you information about your products and services from Natura. Just so you know, nobody can tell you exactly what we do other than us, right? Nobody knows more about the needs of your home and what products we use and what our solutions are better than we can. And it's worded a little bit more eloquently in the actual letter, but that's that's the gist of it. It's warning them that door-to-door -door salesmen are gonna come by, and if they have any questions, make sure they come and check in with us. So the next thing we talk about is just service offerings. I like to remind all of our customers that we're a full-service pest control company, and if they have any pest issues, even if, it's not currently something we do for them to make sure they call us first. That way we can take care of them. And you guys have probably heard of Baton before. We've talked about Baton on our uh, Facebook group and on the podcast. Uh, Baton is a referral-based platform that allows me to refer leads to other pest control companies in my market for services that I don't always do, right? So if somebody wants to trap a raccoon... Uh, right now, I'm not doing that. Sorry, just not my not my wheelhouse. 
So I use Baton to send those raccoon leads to a wildlife trapping company in my market. And when it comes to customers and retention, the best thing is they know that Natura Pest Control in my market is the one-stop shop for anything pest control related. They know that I'm either going to, number one, send out one of my technicians, and they're going to do a phenomenal job taking care of ants, earwig, spiders, etc. Or if I can't take care of it, I'm going to find them a quality referral, and I'm going to take care of the whole connection process for them, and that person's going to get a great company that, even if it isn't me, can still provide a phenomenal service for them. So, Service offerings is another thing that I, I drop in that little loyalty letter. Just let them know, hey, full service pest control company, call us if you have any pest needs and we'll take care of them for you. We also like to mention our credentials in there, you know, associate certified entomologist, all the different licensing that we have, different types of uh, treatments that we do, and of course, different types of structures that we take care of, whether it's commercial, residential, all those other things. And then of course, last but certainly not least, we talk about communication. You know, if they need to get a hold of us, here are all the different ways that they can do that, whether it's by email, Instagram, Facebook, whatever the situation is, and of course, to follow us on all those platforms. So that is the retention letter in a nutshell. If you guys are looking for an example of that, feel free to reach out to me. You can, you know, shoot me a message on Facebook or, you know, whichever, email me or anything like that. You guys all have my contact info. Um, and I'd be happy to send you guys a copy of this letter that we use and you guys can kind of customize it and use it on your own and, and, uh, start getting the benefits of sending out these customer loyalty letters. So we're going to move on here and I want to talk about the thing that everybody expects when we talk about retention. Okay. We're going to talk about the poor customer experiences, um, and you know, how they really have an impact. So when your customer has a bad experience. And we're talking about the type of bad experience that warrants a phone call. Because uh, you, ex- you have to imagine here that customers actually have subpar experiences with service vendors all the time. And they never call. Which is actually kind of scary if you think about it. You know, you can look at your phone and if it's not ringing and you're not getting any bad calls, you're thinking, wow, we must be doing really well. But there's actually this, this trap between doing really well and not doing really well where there's this space where you can have subpar experiences, but they're not bad enough where customers call you. And that's scary to me because I want to know if something is bad uh, right away, whether it warrants a phone call or not. So right off the bat, you just have to remember here that if you don't have a good process when it comes to handling poor customers' experiences, just know that it's probably not their first, likely. And if they contact you, you're going to want to make sure that you take care of this ASAP. So first thing on my list when it comes to poor customer experiences is that we need to make sure we have really good availability and a really phenomenal response time. So one of the things that we did recently in my company is when a customer calls in and they have a bad experience and whether it's you know technician related or unresolved pest issue related or whatever's going on, we have a special type of appointment that we set up in our system so that our customer service team can see it and they don't move it around. Uh, Technicians can see it and they know exactly what it means. They have to go in and do a little, uh, you know, hands-on, kid gloves, really make sure that they're they're, uh, working extra engagement to get this customer happy again. So right off the bat, we have some special indicators in there when a customer has a poor experience. Um, So the response time in this, though, that's kind of the main point, is making sure that your customers get responded to quickly. If a customer calls in and says, hey, I had a problem with the technician and the customer service team says, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I'll have his manager reach out to you as soon as possible. Well, if that manager doesn't reach out within the next five to 10 minutes, every minute after that is another just cut in the experience that your customer has. So keep that in mind. The response time makes a big difference. The other thing that's important is that you want to make sure that your team isn't just apologetic, but they're also solution oriented, right? Um, You know, and every customer here needs some acknowledgement. Every customer needs, you know, those confidence statements. Um, But we need to make sure that we're actually trying to find a solution that's going to meet the customer's needs. And it's not just a band-aid, but it's something that's actually going to work long term. 
Um, the next thing, can we talk about this before? Expedited appointments. So if your customer has a bad experience, obviously you need to make sure that you have um, a technician that's ready to go out there same day, next day. You know, if a customer calls in and says they had a bad experience with a technician and they need to have somebody back out, if they're willing to have somebody back out, um, don't make them wait. Don't make them wait a few days or a week or more. I promise you they will call another company and the next phone call you're going to get is them canceling their service. So the next thing on the list here is just having capable technicians. Now, I'm guessing that you're probably not going to hire anybody who's not capable, but more specifically what I mean here is that the technician needs to be capable of handling a situation when a customer's not happy. When they are upset, whether it's because of another technician or even because of them, you know, if they're going back out to a customer's home who wasn't happy with the service they performed, are they capable of swallowing their pride and putting a smile on their face, being apologetic, being solution oriented and getting that service done, right? We need to make sure that all of our technicians that head out to these specific types of accounts are technicians that we know are going to handle that situation appropriately. The next thing is going to be service protocols. We talked about this before, having consistent and good service protocols. So if we go out to a customer's home because they're upset about the way a service was done, and then we just do the same exact thing over again, and we don't explain what we're doing, or we don't communicate clearly with the customer, not only are they going to be confused, but they're going to be really upset that we wasted their time coming back and doing the exact same thing that they were upset about in the first place. So good service protocols and good communication is going to be good there. We talked about this before, wins, wants, interests, and needs. Man, I can't say this one enough. You want to focus on what the customers see value in. That's the whole thing they're paying for. So win, wants, interests, and needs. And the technician should communicate that explicitly so they know that they're on the same page. We got execution in here. Talked about this one before. It's just make sure the technician executes on the solution that the customer is expecting, as long as it's appropriate, of course. And then we have expectations. You know, is the technician again creating appropriate expectations, whether it's how the products work, where and where not to clean, depending on if you're going to affect the products adversely or anything else to expect when it comes to the service that we provide. The last thing here is going to be post-service care and feedback and some internal evaluation. So post-service care and feedback is essentially checking back with the customer, whether it's the next day or a couple days after, and this could come from your customer service team. And you just say, Hey, you know, Susan, I just want to follow up with you. I know that we didn't have a great experience, you know, a couple of days ago and we sent back Joey and he was able to come out and, and reapply the service. Just want to check in on you and see how that, that service went with Joey. And hopefully that customer says, Oh, it went splendid. Joey was great big turnaround from what I experienced last time. Thank you guys so much for sending him out. In fact, if you could send him out more, that would be wonderful. That's what I'm looking for. Hopefully we're not going to run into a scenario where they're like, nope, still not happy. You guys suck. Right. But the benefit there is I reached out to them and they're still upset. If I don't reach out and we've done a follow-up treatment because they were upset in the first place and they have to reach back out to me, there's only one reason they're calling and it's to cancel. So keep that in mind. And then the internal evaluation section of this is looking at the scenario and trying to unpack it a little bit for the benefit of our training purposes, right? So, you know, if we go back to a service manager and we say, Hey, just want to follow up on this. We had this issue with the technician. This is what he said or did. And this is why the customer was upset. We had to send a technician back out to fix the problem. How can we avoid this in the future, right? What do we have to do? What kind of, uh, you know, training protocols can we put in place to ensure that this problem becomes less and less likely, right? So the internal evaluation is going to be a big part here. Um, the next situation, and I'm going to try to <clears throat> be a little bit short winded when it comes to this, because this is a big part, but this has to do with the actual cancellation retention call. You know, when the customer calls you to cancel. And uh, we've talked about this a few different times in the podcast and again on, um, you know, in and out of posts in the Facebook group. But I'm going to kind of zip through how I train my team to handle retention calls. The first thing here is that we have a dedicated communication process. It's the same communication process that I use for sales 
customer service, retention. It's the same thing that I teach to all the companies that I consult for. Uh, it's something that we've been working on for years and years and years. And this is the brief overview. The first thing that you want to have your technicians do when customers are upset is you want to make sure that they acknowledge the situation that they're upset or that they acknowledge their desire to cancel. If you sidestep that or try to steer a customer away from that direction right off the bat, uh, you're not going to get anywhere because now you're battling against what they want, even if it's not exactly the outcome you are looking for, right? So first thing, acknowledgement, right? You want to validate that customer's feelings. And then later on, we're going to try to find a solution that includes them keeping our service. So acknowledgement is going to be the first thing here. Next thing is confidence, right? Hey, I, I know we can get this taken care of. I know that we can find a solution that works out for us here, right? I'm happy to get this taken care of for you. Thank you so much for calling. Build confidence. That's going to be a big thing. The next section here is what we call investigating, right? Or even before that, we might even use a transition statement where it says, hey, I'm just going to ask you a couple questions. Make sure I fully understand what's going on, right? And then you ask some questions. You know, hey, tell me more about your experience with that technician. You know, we strive to have a really phenomenal experience with our customers. It sounds like you didn't get that. What was going on, right? And as you're asking these questions, what you're doing is that you're either uncovering or you're learning more about those customers' wins. Again, right? You've heard this before, wants, interests, and needs, okay? If you're going to create a solution that's in any way effective to keep your customer on board, you have to know what they see interest in, and you have to be able to deliver a solution that fits those wins, okay? So speaking of the solution, once you understand all of that, then you can provide a solution and then you can close, right? Or in this situation, you provide the solution and then hopefully you schedule, you know, either a reservice or whatever the end up closing of that scenario is, right? So, you know, for example, I've got a customer who had a bad experience with a technician. You know, a technician went out and was kind of short, you know, kind of frustrated, maybe he was having a tough day and, you know, kind of refused to take care of the inside of the customer's house and was like, hey, I don't have time for this. I got to go by, right? You know, they call in, they're upset, of course, understandably and we go through the communication process right customer says hey i, I want to cancel my service you know and i say oh my gosh susan i'm i'm so sorry to hear that you know it looks like you've been with us for three years and it seems like you've been happy what's going on that's making you want to do something different and she says well your technician came out here he was really short with me he refused to do the inside of the, of, of the house and we're just we're not going to deal with this anymore we're going to go somewhere else and I say, oh my gosh, Susan, I, I am so sorry to hear that. You know, if that was my experience with a service professional, I would be just as frustrated as you are. That's really not even appropriate. And I, I can't believe that you got that kind of experience from one of my technicians, right? I'm taking ownership here. One of my technicians. You know, I would really like to dig into this and I'm sure, I'm positive we can work this out. And maybe she says, you know what? I appreciate that, but I, I, still, I still just want to cancel my service, right? And I say, hey, Susan, I totally understand. And you know what? I, I'd be happy or I'd be happy to help you with this and make sure we can take care of this for you. And then we transition a little bit. Hey, I'm just going to ask you a few questions. You know, Susan, when the technician came out, um, you know, was he kind of angry from the get go? Was he upset from the very beginning or did it kind of progressively get worse? At what point do you feel like the situation turned? You know, we kind of get some information. We talk about stuff. We go through some, through some things. Right. And through some questions, I figure out that one. Susan really likes when technicians slow down, right? I figure out that she likes thorough and clear communication, and she doesn't like how fast-paced everything is, right? So I'm thinking, okay, great, I got one of those wins. And I also figure out uh, that Susan, you know, never really felt like she got the full inside of the home treated. From the initial service, we barely did some, some spot treatment inside, and she really felt like we didn't really do a thorough service. So those two things right away are big, you know, red flags to me, at least for wins, right? I know what I'm looking for here. So when I provide a solution for Susan, I might say, hey, Susan, look, I know that we, we really didn't um, provide you the experience that you were expecting and definitely not the one that I want you to have. You know, I have a, a technician. He's one of our lead technicians. He's really, really good, super thorough. And I think he communicates the way that you really appreciate. I would love to have him come out there and show you the way that I want you to experience the service. We can be out there tomorrow. Would you, would you let me do that 
for you and for me. Could I have my technician come out there and really show you how this should look? That way you don't have to make any extra phone calls. You don't have to call anybody else. Let me prove it to you. Does that sound like a plan, right? Now, if that's the way that you come to the solution, uh, about 80 to 90% of the time that works, okay? You know, 10 to 20% of the time, hey, maybe not. <laughs> but, you know, having a good communication process makes a huge difference. So a um, couple other things here just to touch on this. Got to have expectations, appropriate expectations like we talked about before, right? If I'm, this, if I'm the rep talking to the customer and I'm delivering a solution, I got to make sure that that solution is applicable and viable for the technician to actually execute on, right? And then again here, we have internal evaluation. So we're going to make sure that if we messed up on something, we go through the proper channels to review and evaluate that, make sure that doesn't happen again. And then one big thing here is tracking the data, okay? Um, if you aren't tracking, number one, how many cancellation calls you have, okay, track that. Number two, I want to know what the reason for them canceling is. And number three, I want to know how many customers I saved by reason, right? And this allows me to, number one, track my cancellation call volume over time. I can see when cancellation calls are high and when they're low, right? And I should be able to look at other trends in the market and see, okay, maybe this is when door-to-door -door salesmen are going to be around. Or, hey, this is when it's a really tough time for pest activity. This is when we struggle the most with the efficacy of our products or the residual of the products, right? I want to track that. So tracking the, the data over time allows me to see what the performance of the team is, what their retention percentage is, what the attrition of our customers is, and what the volume of cancellation opportunities is over the course of months and years and so on and so forth. And I promise, you know, for all the people out there that aren't super data-driven or numbers-driven, this is important. You can do this with a simple spreadsheet. That's what my team does. We track that data and we, we keep a hold of it. And then we review it together as a team once a week. We look at the data and we say, okay, here's what we struggle with when it comes to retention. And this is why we talk to the service team and say, hey, what do these numbers tell you? You know, when you're looking at this data, how can we make improvements so that we avoid cancellation issues in the future, right? And there are some little nuances in the data and there's some other interesting things about what the numbers tell you. I don't have time to dive into that today, but we're going to come back to that in the Bug Bucks course. So keep an eye out for that. And last thing here, I'm going to give you guys a little bonus uh, category. This one's about win back campaigns. When I say win back, I mean winning your customer back after they cancel. So if you guys don't have win back campaigns rolling, you're missing out. And I'll kind of explain how these work. So first things first, when you end the relationship with a customer, when they cancel their service, always make sure you end on a good note. I can't stress this enough. Some of these are going to be really emotionally charged conversations. Sometimes customers are going to say things to you and about you and about your technicians and employees that are inappropriate. They're very hurtful, right? Be professional. Understand that they are coming from a very emotional experience on their end. And after they've had a few days or a couple weeks, uh, they're going to completely not necessarily forget about it, but the emotions are going to wear off, right? And if they were being a jerk, they're going to feel sorry for that. And I've had people call me back and apologize before, but that only works if you can keep your cool. Because if you respond likewise, then all you're doing is just solidifying their idea of hating you. So when they lash out, don't respond in kind, be professional, and make sure you end on a good note. That way the door is open in the future if you want it to be. Doors open in the future for them to come back. Okay. The next thing is keeping communication open. And this is going to involve getting updated contact information. So you know, worst case scenario, customer cancels and we're on the phone and I, you know, do a little solution and they de decline it, right? And I say, hey, you know what? I would love to have you come back sometime if that's ever in the cards for you guys. And a lot of customers will say, sure, we'd love to come back someday, right? And I say, that's wonderful. You know what? 
I'll make sure that we still send you guys our, our regular newsletter. I'll make sure that you guys get emails and little tips and tricks and stuff like that. Just want to double check here. Is this email address still good for you? And they say, yeah, that's my email. I say, perfect. And of course, this phone number is good for you. See, that's the one you're calling from. They're like, yep, that's the one. And I say, perfect. I'll make sure that you guys get, you know, any uh, returning specials, discounts, anything like that. And I'll make sure that I put notes on your account so that when you do come back, we're able to take care of you just as well as when we did before, right? Assuming that, you know, they didn't have a horrible, horrible experience. Um, and that kind of takes me to, to my next thing here is leaving good notes on the account. Everybody has a CRM. You know, I use field routes um, and there's a lot of other CRMs that are out there. And all of those CRMs should have one thing in common, which is the ability to put notes on accounts, right? This is a customer service 101 kind of thing here. You want to make sure that you leave detailed notes, not just customers canceling or customer had bad experience canceling or customer can't afford it or anything that's like that. Those notes suck. They tell me very, very little. But if instead it says, customer had a bad experience with the technician when he came out and refused to do the inside of the house. She felt like he was a bad communicator, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Offered this save offer, you know, offered to have the technician come back, offered to have a lead technician come back, offered to provide loyalty discount, et cetera, et cetera. Let them know that we'd be happy to have them back one day, et cetera, et cetera. Now, that probably seems like a lot. You're like, dude, Eric, I can't have my customer service team just notating accounts all day long. Those notes are crucial when it comes to being able to reactivate that customer, right? Because you're gonna look at that scenario in the future, they're gonna call back, we have a lot of customers that call back, and you're gonna to wanna to know all the ins and outs, for better or for worse. Because sometimes you're gonna have notes on the accounts that pop up when you look at it and it says, do not reactivate, customer is emotionally abusive, almost got in a fight with the technician and then cussed out the customer service manager over the phone. And this was like two years ago, right? And they call in and you bring up the account and you're looking at this thinking, oh no, you know, obviously they, they need a pest control company now and they're happy now, but what happens if they get upset again, right? So keep that in mind. Good notes are always going to be a good thing. And if you have really crappy notes, you're just setting yourself up for yet another bad situation, bad cancellation call, et cetera. So, all right, guys. That is the last five tips when it comes to retention, plus a little bonus win back tip. I really appreciate you all listening. And uh, if you've got a business partner, manager, friend, or just somebody you know who would benefit from a better understanding of how to prevent and manage attrition and save more customers, please share this episode. One last reminder, if you haven't already, please join our Bug Bucks Facebook group. That is B-U-G-B-U-X. And of course, this episode is brought to you by Bug Bucks Plus, the number one course designed to help you start and grow your pest control company. Make sure you check it out at bugbucksplus.com. And until the next episode, keep building those pest control companies. If you enjoyed today's episode, please show your support by subscribing and leaving us a five-star rating. Thank you. And we'll catch you on next week's episode.